to today's sunset safari and what a way to start with two female warthogs and their offspring so they look to be one two three four five little ones aren't they just cute there we go it's a sweltering 30 degrees Celsius, 80, 86 Fahrenheit, if I remember correctly. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Brian Joubert on camera with me today. And we have James Hendry and Andrew Joseph Francis on the other vehicle. And we have Kirsten and Geraldine in the final control. So really exciting. Some cloud coming in after a really warm day. We can see, hopefully, there will be some rain a little later after the safari, of course. But we're just going to sit with these little warthogs out there, just sweet. You watch how they're already climbing onto their haunches. So we do get two pig species in the Sabi Sands. This is the one we see the most of. It is the more common and, and also the most active during the daylight hours. We do get bush pigs. They're quite rare in the Sabi Sands, but those are nocturnal. Warthogs is called a sounder, it is the collective noun for most of the pigs. Now, these females will do an incredible job if they manage to get all of these babies to adulthood. Baby warthogs are favored snacks for lion, leopard, cheetah, even. Dominant male leopard in these parts seems to have a real taste for water. Go have a look at them, they're suckling. Two of them at least. Oh, and the other two are going to suckle at. So it looks like one female's got three and the other's got two. So the dominant male leopard in this area has a real taste for warthog. We've actually watched him go right underground into a water, warthog burrow to grab a little one. No. An adult warthog is quite a task for most predators to bring down. Uh, got that very impressive weapons on the front. There's the tusks, so those nice big white tusks that we see out in the front, those look the most impressive. But it's actually the small ones underneath that are sharpened against the big ones. Those are called tushes, and those are literally like razor blades, and they can do some serious damage to a predator who's either after the babies or after the adult itself. So warthogs not only eat the grass that we see peeking out above the ground, they will also use the very hard nose to actually dig under to get some of the tubers and bulbs out from under the ground, or the, from, from the grass and from different plant species. There we go. See how she gets onto her knees like that, enabling her to get a little bit closer to the ground and feed with a little bit more ease. You can see the little ones are not only suckling, but also partaking in the grazing that's available. There's a little African vagrant butterfly in front of them. Flop, oh, there it goes. A very 
very warm safari live. Welcome to Sean in Secunda. Sean is wondering, does a male warthog pose a threat to lion, hyena? Uh, most definitely a male warthog is a really big animal and a serious set of tusks and tushes on them so they are able to defend themselves. There are very few leopard that will go for an adult warthog. Brian, if we actually come a bit closer in towards us here, just off the side of the vehicle, fluttering around. Have you got it there? You had it. It's being a little bit difficult. Beautiful little butterfly. And it's called a sulfur tip. And it's got those wonderful orange tips to the wings, and you'll see the black on the center of it when it takes off. There we go. Very pretty. Now let's leave these warthogs to continue feeding. And while we do that, let's go see what else we can find. James told me there were some lion tracks in this area this morning. So I'm hopefully my kitty cat luck is still in play. Uh, we're going to see if we can find any tracks from during the day. And hopefully even better, find those cats. Hello everybody, I'm just reversing like a total moron. Um, there was a stien book to look at, and it says, ooh, Andrew, can you get him? Can you see him? He's in there, stien book, spectacular stien book sighting, Andrew, there, he's that red thing in the middle of the picture. Well done. Right, good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari with Rusty. James on vocals and Andrew on the camera. Hello, Andrew. Hello, everybody. Yes, very nice. And the Steenbock on center stage. He's a very shy Steenbock. This is the want of his kind. They hide behind the bushes and look, try and look as inconspicuous as possible, which of course has given rise to their name Steenbock or Stone Buck, which basically means, um, well, they lie like stones. Now, I'm sure Brent's told you, you're on a live safari. It's wonderful to have you with us on what is a Sunday afternoon here, a Monday morning in Fiji. And, um, well, you're probably almost all in Sunday in the States by now, so that's very good. And welcome to it. I hope it's a good time for you. Please do talk to us. We love to hear from you. Your questions and comments, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. I think you can also talk to us on the YouTube stream. Uh, that sort of um, social media savviness is beyond my, the realms of my comprehension, but I think that's how you do it. And we are completely live. We've had a couple of doubting Thomases of late um, who say, I can't believe this is live. It surely can't be. Test us out. Send us through a question and see how quickly we can get back to you. And it is indeed live in high definition from the wilds of the Greater Kruger National Park here in northeastern South Africa, possibly the most beautiful country in the world. Let's go. We're going to be heading west today towards Arathusa. And Arathusa is the, we, we traverse two little reserves in what is the Greater Kruger National Park. And one of them is Juma, that's the one we're on now. And that's about 900 hectares. And then off to the western side of us is 600 hectares of a reserve called Arathusa. There are no fences between any of the reserves that we mention. So we will come up to borders. We're coming up to the southern border now but you'll notice there's no fence so it's a completely un, uh, sort of continuous wildlife area so all the animals can come and go as they please depending on their territories and their home ranges and what's chasing them of course and there is an impala as I was saying this morning, a friend of mine used to guide and he said he made sure that he stopped from parlor every day, just once at least, simply because they are so magnificent and we drive past them such a lot. Gerda, you want to know about the sable, the rarest of the nine antelope species that have been seen here. And I'm so sad I didn't see it when it came across the Juma Dam 
in the infrared glow of the, the dam cam about a week and a half ago. You want to know if it's been seen again. Gerda, it hasn't. It hasn't popped up on any of our groups. So I don't think it has been seen again. But what a privilege to see the sable antelope, which is just, I mean, the most stunning name. I wonder if anyone could tell me there on YouTube or, um, well, not on YouTube, well, on YouTube or on whatever feed you happen to be watching, any viewer, the word sable, does it, I've been under the impression that it means black and white. Does anybody know what the word sable means? It'd be very nice to know. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And if you don't know what a sable antelope is, it is a beautiful black and white, well, sort of white. It's got some a white belly, but it's a, the bulls are black all over the top, and they've got these tremendous scimitar-shaped horns, which are very vicious if they're attacked by lions. That, of course, is not a vicious scimitar-horned horse-like antelope. It is an impala possibly one of the most successful herbivores to ever grace the planet. Also very good at stamping, you can see. With both front and back feet, and you see that? Excellent stampage. Okay, let's continue along the road here. So like I was saying, this is our southern boundary. You can see off to the left-hand side is to the south, and that was where we cannot go, but the animals can go. And to the north is Juma. Ranger, you know that we're live, but I will do this for you anyway. You say, how quickly can I turn my hat around to show you that we're live? There you are. Extrang, I hope that wasn't a poor attempt at trying to see my bald spot. I've, um, I've learned how to replace my headgear, turn it around in various ways so that my bald spot is not exposed to the camera lens because it actually faces, when I'm sitting like this, the camera lens shines directly onto my bald spot. So were I to take my hat off, a blinding light would flash through your computer screen and render you sightless for at least 10 minutes. Not really. See that, Andrew? You're lucky you don't have to do that yet. Oh! Christopher in Arizona, this is wonderful. I'd actually wondered when this was exactly. And um, we're just crossing onto Arethusa now. Um, Christopher, you wanted to you want to know if uh, foot, American football is a big sport here. It isn't. Uh, do we get Super Bowl Sunday? Apparently, it's Super Bowl Sunday today, and we won't. Um, I think you you can watch. You can probably watch it on something called Super Sport, which is a major sort of sports television pay television site here um, or channel here. I think you'll probably be able to get it on that. But certainly, uh, I, yeah, it's not an enormous sport here. No one really plays it. I don't, in fact, I don't think anyone plays it. But but if I'm not mistaken, Christopher, the Denver Broncos are, have made the... Did they make the Super Bowl this year? I don't know. Christopher, please tell me, because I have a small soft spot for the Denver Broncos. And they're playing the Panthers, that's right. There we go. The Carolina Panthers versus the Denver Broncos. Now, that actually has quite an interesting story behind it. Um, well, it's interesting for me. Um, I, at one stage of my life, uh, was seeing an American lady, and she was from originally North Carolina. Her mother still lives there. And then she moved to Denver and was an enormous Denver Broncos fan. And so for a long time, I received paraphernalia from the Broncos. Bright orange, unwearable in public, but very nice to have at various stages of my early guiding career. So I hope that I hope the Broncos give the Panthers a bit of a hiding. Right, like I say, we are on Arethusa. What I'm going to do is to change the. All 
right, we're going to go across to Brent. I'm starting to lose the final control. We might not be in Arathusa for long in Rusty. Let's head across to Brent. I'll keep you posted and see you just now. So are we checking this area around a Gallagher shortcut to see if any of those lion tracks possibly pop out onto the road? If not, we're going to head deeper into this block, check around the Gallagher pan, check that little river system that's in there. They might have gone into that nice, cool, shady area to rest during the heat of the day. And apparently it's Super Bowl Sunday in the US today, so I'm sure quite a lot of people are very excited. I'm going to probably cause quite a bit of trouble with this statement, but uh, I don't even know who's playing. But if the Patriots are playing, go Patriots! So, so apparently not Patriots, it's the North Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos. So, mm, as James is apparently going for the Panthers, so Brian, should we go for the Broncos? The Broncos. Broncos all the way. Just going really slowly through here. Just trying to find one of those beautiful cat prints on the road. So far, only hippopotamus footprints and the old buffalo. is literally folding up its leaves quite a bit. And what it's doing is it's turning the underside, which is a lighter color, to face the sun. So reflect a bit of that heat and also closes its spiracles, its sort of breathing holes, for lack of a better description, uh, to help maintain water loss. So it's actually reacting to the dry and hot weather by putting the dark side away from the sun and the lighter side up towards to try to reflect a bit of that sunlight and help with a bit uh, help with the water loss so if we let's coach forward a little bit we can see where the leaves are not in the sunlight you can see how the darker side is still facing out to the front and any leaf in the sunlight has started to really turn to try and minimize the water loss sometimes and oh dear it escaped did you see that flash of electric blue we just saw brian's eyes light up there was a gray hooded kingfisher that amazing blue as it flew off maybe it'll come around onto the next road um, but no, bush pigs tend to live in thickets during the day in sounders they can be quite big family groups even up to 20 individuals 
right, there we go. He has an interesting question for everyone out there. Uh, how many different types of pigs are indigenous to Africa? And those are not subspecies, but just individual species of pigs indigenous to Africa. Let's see who out there might know that. If you know how many indigenous pig species there are in Africa, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. James said the last tracks were coming in from this area, heading towards the little river system there. So we're going to go have a look from this side, see if we can pick up on any tracks crossing through the area. If not, it does make the area that they might be in a lot smaller. Gone deep into the thicket, but there was a little squirrel who shot across the road in front of us. Jeff in Staten Island is wondering what's the average speed we drive while we're on moving through the different areas. I would probably say around 10 or 15 kilometers an hour, so not very fast at all. Of course, sometimes we go a bit faster to get from point A to B, specifically if there is a sighting there, but mostly we drive at about this speed, so very, very slowly. Approaching a waterhole now, and you never know what might be there. It could be anything. It has been quite hot. Maybe the lions decided to come for a midday drink. Unlikely, but not impossible. Well, we do have some animals here, not the ones we're searching for. But another member of Africa's Big Five. Cape Buffalo. Now this particular group of buffalo we're looking at here are all what you would sort of name retired gentlemen. Past their prime, they've been pushed out of the, the big breeding herds. And they tend to stay very close to waterholes and river systems where there's ample graze and browse and water without them having to move big distances. Can be quite cantankerous. One of the more dangerous animals on foot in the African bush from a vehicle, 100% fine. And it's quite often because they are a little bit old and you can surprise them. They're a little bit deaf, a little bit blind. And quite often they like to lie up in thickets, so you can surprise them at a very close range. So always important to be very conscious when walking around rivers or waterholes for old buffalo bulls like these guys. You can see those gnarled bosses, the bosses that center part of his horns there. It's actually just really, really compacted hair. But on these old boys, it's literally as hard as steel. Uh, the reason they stay in little bachelor groups like this is a protection. And of course, the more of you are, the odds of you being the one the lions catch are less. And also more sets of eyes and ears to spot potential predators.
all so so far i think i've caught you all and uh, a lot of people on the pig quiz uh, a lot of people are saying two a lot of people and someone said three uh, you are in correct in all incorrect so there are more than three but how many more than three i'm not gonna let on to you just yet Let's leave these gentlemen. We're very close to where I really want to check for those lion tracks. And who knows, with the lions in the area, these guys might be in for a tough evening. So while we go check for tracks in the base of this river system, let's jump back on with Jamesy and see what he's up to. There, everybody, is a waterbuck, our first mammal here on Arethusa. We're quite close, appropriately, to the Arethusa Dam, which is just in front of the camp. And that, of course, will become prime territory for these waterbuck now. Apparently, with waterbuck, because obviously water is not sort of thick on the ground, especially at this time of the year, well, normally this time of year, it's pretty, it's pretty thick, but now that we're in a drought, only probably one in eight or so waterbuck will actually have a territory. The others will have to sort of show submissive behavior within the dominant bull's territory. And apparently what he does is he allows them sort of to do this because otherwise, you know, being waterbuck, they'd struggle. And eventually they will kind of muscle in on his territory and a new dominant will take over once the, uh, the, big, the big chap either loses condition or gets old enough and loses his, his territory. So that's how it works. It's quite an interesting social structure. And they don't, I mean, I've never seen them leap into the water as a sort of form of defense, but I suppose they must do it quite often if they're being chased. I don't think there are many prides of lions here that would specialize them in them. And I also don't think that there are many well, there are certainly no hyena clans that specialize in them. And those are the only two predators that would be able to take down an enormous water buck bull like this. But he's a rather spectacular fellow, isn't he? Magnificent horns. A little bit like a sable's horns, but a sable's horns are longer and they're sort of more deeply curved, more scimitar-like. You know what a scimitar is, Andrew? Top of sword. Yes, exactly. Kind of thing that you would have read about in A Thousand Nights, I think. If I'm not mistaken. And I just love the smell of them. Mmm. Ah. Thank you, Diane and Lynn. Apparently, sable doesn't mean black and white at all. It refers to a dark brown color. So I suppose... I mean, the, the females are definitely a dark brown color. Maybe that's the sort of sable. The bulls are definitely pretty black. I, th I guess it, it's probably more accurately an extremely dark brown rather than black. And they're certainly born brown. Thank you very much, Lynn and Diane. That's great. I now know it's always nice to have your vocabulary increased slightly. It's the, trying to remember that, of course, that is the difficulty these days. You know, getting old, Andrew. As Brent likes to point out. Old, bald and short. And I was just saying I love the smell of them. They've got that musky smell, of course. It comes from a gland that goes under the skin. And one of the reasons they think I've yet to read anything that I find convincing about why they have that smell. One of the reasons, I think, is to try and make the skin waterproof. But, I mean, there are hundreds of animals out here, us included, that have waterproof skin that don't have to have oily musk glands that make us smell like sweaty horses. That said, I have met people that do smell like sweaty horses, of course. They're magnificent. They don't normally stand quite this confidingly for us. So that's just great. Right. Andrew, shall we press on? Let's go and see what's at the water. So his Latin name is Cobus ellipsiprimnus, and the ellipsiprimnus part of it refers to his uh, bottom, which has a 
white ring around it. Ooh, there he goes. You showed us his ellipsi primness there. Um, ellipsis, obviously, meaning round. And primness, if I'm not mistaken, meaning hind end. Gracie in Ohio. You don't feel so well today, Gracie. I'm sorry about that. That's not nice at all. And your tummy's a bit sore. We will do our very, very best to try and find some elephants for you. You say that would make you feel better. Well, I'm definitely going to drive high and low in an attempt to find you some ele elephants. And then we'll hopefully make your tummy feel a little bit better. You hang in there and be brave and we will try and find you some elephants. In the meantime, though, Gracie, there's some warthogs just up ahead. Jeepers, look how dry this dam is, Andrew. Now, I haven't been here for the last four weeks or so. Wow. It's got very, very dry indeed. I'm just going to stop here before those warthogs disappear. So a slightly older family than the one you were looking at with Brent. And of course, we, call, we don't call it a family of warthogs so much as a sounder. And that looks like a sow in the front and three sub-adult piglets behind. They're such fun, aren't they? Wonderful things. And unfortunately, as I was saying yesterday, they're the ones that will suffer from the drought far more than anyone else will. With those short little legs, migrating is not possible. Hmm. Annie, I'll try and find you a skull to really answer this question for you, but you want to know, are those warts on the warthog uh, attached to the skull or are they cartilage? Um, Annie, they're not attached to the skull. They're actually just, I'm not even sure that they're too thickly cartilage. You can see them from when they're little. They've got little, they look, actually look like proper warts when they're tiny little piglets. And they're definitely not attached to the skull at all. If you see a warthog skull, you can't tell, uh, well, you can tell if it's male and female from the size and the, from the tusks, but you cannot tell. There are no protuberances from those warts. Straight into the water to have a swim. That is fantastic. <laughs> This, of course, Gracie, is a good place to start looking for elephants. It's been quite a hot day, but not too bad. And so maybe the elephants have decided they won't come and have a drink here just yet. A little sound that having a swim pleasantly, and I mean, there must be some hippo in here somewhere, Andrew. Can you see the hippo in amongst the hyacinth? Right, just a quick and very warm welcome and greeting to the Times Destination Show in, uh, well, I hope it's relatively sunny London with Will Fox and Hayden Turner. Hello, chaps. Very nice to see you there. Well, I can't see you. Of course, you can possibly see me. Well, you can't see me yet, but you can see some warthogs. And it's very good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us for the next half hour. That's a European bee eater that's just flown through your screen. Andrew, can you see the beautiful colors on that thing there? Wow. Look at that. He's right up there. Beautiful European bee eater. Isn't that wonderful? Golden back, glorious golden back. In some places called the golden backed bee eater. And please do feel free to chat to us from the Times Destination Show. Be good to hear from you. Ask us questions. 
anything you like about what we're doing, the animals we're seeing, and anything like that. My name is James Henry. On camera is Andrew. Say hello again, Andrew. Hello there. <laughs> and there, we're just looking at some warthogs, and they are lying in the water, obviously because it's quite a warm day. It's not very hot. It is cooling down now, thankfully. There is some cloud coming over, but you can see the dam in front of this lodge, which is called Arethusa, is pretty dry, and that's because of the lack of rain that we've had this year. Probably less, I'd say, hmm, what should we say, roughly 10% of the normal rainfall, so really a tiny fraction of the rainfall that we would have normally. Normally, this area has an area of uh, probably a rainfall of up to 600 millimeters, which is about 24 inches. In fact, it's exactly 24 inches. That would be in a really kind of good rain year, uh, but certainly between between 16 and 24 inches and this year probably we've had less than a tenth of that or between a tenth and a, a, a fifth Okay, an unusual sighting coming up for you now with Brent Leo Smith. He's back on Juma at the moment, just in, probably in front of Weir Taylor Camp. There is a hippopotamus there with him, and I will see you shortly. So we are on our way to try and find the last of the tracks of the Nkahuma Pride, and I was about to jump off and go for a walk, and this gentleman dissuaded me from doing so. We've got a big adult bull hippo here, and just quickly a big welcome to Will Fox and Hayden Turner at the Times Destination Travel Show in London. Can you believe you're watching a hippo in real time? from London and we're sitting in the middle of the African bush. Oh, we're right in front of Viatella camp at the moment. So, hi Phil, who's also at the Times Destination Travel Show. At least I'm getting my tongue around that one. Phil would like to know on an average day out here, how many of the big five do we see? I would say probably on average, Phil, uh, three to four on average. Uh, that it all depends on, on, on climate and stuff at the time, but uh, three to four, and then probably a good couple of days of the week, we'll see all five. But not only them, we also, very fortunate, we see quite a lot of wild dog in this area as well. So this bull has been forced out of the big dams that are full of the ladies. And this guy is actually quite an old bull, not a young bull. These are the two sort of nomadic and solitary hippo bulls we find, either an old, old one or a young one. And you can actually, if you look carefully along his skin, you can see there's quite a lot of old wounds and puncture marks. So we are experiencing an incredibly dry time at the moment. And this poor guy is having to stay in the tiny little water hole in front of the Vuitella Lodge. Only available water that doesn't have other angry hippos who will chase him out. Now the reason I say he's an old boy as opposed to a young boy, apart from his numerous scars, is every now and then we can just see into his mouth and his teeth are quite corroded and, and blackened. see there and fascinating watch even though they have those massive teeth that's not what they use to eat so they use those really strong powerful lips to pluck the grass now hippo have that incredible front dentition and uh, where their canines and incisors have developed into massive weapons but they do still have nice rounded molars at the back of their mouth uh, for chewing the grass. Sorry guys, uh, Jamie's just calling me on the radio. She's out on the tracking team this afternoon. Standing by Jamie.
Toby, thanks very much. Where Bart's on Gallagher shortcut? Kobe, thank you. Uh, well, come give you a hand in that area uh, once we move away from Vuyatella. So good news from Jamie uh, that those lion tracks, she's found them a little bit to the north of us. So we're going to leave this hippo bull and go see if we can find those cats. So now looking at this hippo, Jenna is wondering how long do hippos spend out of the water as opposed to in the water? Well, Jenna, here we're looking at an abnormal situation. The fact that it's so dry uh, and there's very little grass around, we've had very little rain, is the reason that this guy is out at this time of the day. But generally, uh, when times are good, they'll normally spend your, most of the daylight hours in the water, occasionally coming out to bask on the bank, but they wouldn't be walking around feeding like that in this particular area. And one must remember that area, animal behavior is different all over, and it also depends on the availability of food. So it's not that usual to see these guys wandering around at this time of the day, but uh, speaking of hippo in the water, I think James has got some who are wallowing in the water to show you. So two, three actually, hippo right here in the same dam where you last saw us. And this one in picture, of course, is, well, he's not alone. He's being passengered by a serrated hinged terrapin. And that's that little chelonid or freshwater turtle that lives on the hippo's back. Well, he doesn't live on the hippo's back. He's just kind of sunning himself there and will plop back into the water at some stage. He threatened to fall off a few times, but he's still there. And he will eat sort of ticks, and he's almost like an ox pecker of the water. He'll eat ticks off the hippo, and he'll also eat other little invertebrates that he can find. And if he's really lucky, he'll catch a bird or two as they come down to drink. And then also, just to the right-hand side of that, we've got some lily trotters, or African jacana. And they have got the most tremendously long toes, which helps them to run along the, it sort of distributes their mass very effectively. And so they're able to run along the water vegetation without falling in and becoming wet, of course. Now, there, I said there were three hippos here. One of them is very small. And it was doing some sort of acrobatic, acrobatic sort of uh, dolphin-like behaviors just before you came. Right, now a question from Julia in the t at the Times Destination Show. You want to know how far from the Kruger Park we are, Julia, and what is the best time to visit the Sabi Sands? Um, Julia, we're actually part of the Greater Kruger National Park, and the actual official Kruger National Park boundary is probably about 10 kilometers to the west of where I'm sitting now, so about six miles, uh, sorry, east of where I'm sitting now. And, but it's obviously an unfenced boundary. So we are part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which is three and a half million acres, or hectares, sorry, of contiguous wildlife land. And that in turn is part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which covers three countries, a little bit into Zimbabwe, and then quite a lot east into Mozambique. So that's the area that we're sitting in. And the actual Kruger traditional is about six miles off in an easterly direction over there. And then as for the best of time of year to visit the Sabi Sands, um, there's no real best time. You can come any time of the year. It's really nice. It's just different depending on when you come. Normally, the summer months like this, the vegetation is very thick and very green, and it actually looks verdant. You can't, it's, it's unlike a lot of the pictures that you see of Africa. There's often a big storm blowing in at this time of the afternoon, and it dumps some rain on us, and there's just, you get a wonderful African thunderstorm. And if you come at this time of the year, you can expect to see lots of young animals, uh, you know, they're born in around November, December time, the young antelope and young warthogs, and the predators, of course, they will attend them uh, depending on how many there are.
So that's this time of year. If you come in the winter time, uh, which is, it would be any time from sort of May, June, July, August, uh, it's a lot drier. The grass and vegetation is a lot more sparse, so the game is slightly easier to see. It's not cold here, of course. It drops to about four degrees Celsius, uh, which is not very really cold at all, uh, it, especially if you happen to be from Britain. Um, and that's an excellent time of the year. Sorry, I'm just looking at the bee eater. We've already seen him. It's the European bee eater just flying down over the dam there. And so that's a good time of year to come. And it used to be known as South Africa's best kept secret because no, nobody from overseas used to come here then because it was your summertime and you were enjoying it over there. But the, I suppose the only disadvantage, if you can see it as that, I don't really see it as that, is that the the vegetation looks a lot more harsh. The grass is a golden color. And if you're not used to it, it can be, I mean, it can look a little harsh, but you'd get over that within a couple of hours, I think. So the winter time's also very good. Uh, the spring time is wonderful. Uh, the, normally before the rains, up until sort of November time, it's very dry. The water's very concentrated. It can be very hot, but because the water's so concentrated after the dry season, animal viewing is fantastic. So those are the kinds of things you're looking at. Any time of the year is good to come here. Um, there's certainly no time of year that's off limits at all. Nice question. Thank you for that. Right. I think we've uh, probably milked this dam for all it's going to give us at the moment. The only thing to tell you is that there are some impala coming in from the far eastern side of the dam. And they're just grazing there on some of the last greenery that there is. And things are a little tough at the moment for the animals with the lack of rain. But that is part of the completely normal cycle of things. It's not unusual for this part of the world to experience fairly severe droughts now and then. And that's how the animals and the plants and the rest of the organisms in this area have evolved. They've evolved ad and adapted to survive under some fairly harsh conditions. All righty then, on we go. see what else Arathusa has to offer us at this stage of the afternoon. Hello, Sheila from the Times Destination Show. You're obviously particularly well informed and you want to know if Shadow, who is a nine-year-old female leopard that we review quite regularly, mostly on Arethusa here, you want to know if she has had cubs. Uh, not as far as we know. We do think she's pregnant. There may or may not have been suckle marks on her. It can be quite difficult to tell. It's possible that she has cubs. We don't know. Certainly a den site has not been identified at this stage. Nice question, Sheila. Thank you. With any luck, yes. And very soon we'll be viewing, oops, very soon we'll be viewing some young leopards. She certainly has been mating, of course. Uh, well, she's done some fairly enthusiastic mating three or four times with um, different males, and one of them hopefully has been successful. We're also possibly going to have some new lion cubs fairly soon. I know that the Birmingham boys, which are now the sort of dominant coalition in this area, they have been mating extensively with the Styx Pride to the east of us and the Inkohuma Pride, which comes onto Juma, and a little bit onto Arethusa. And so with any luck, we'll have lion cubs too. And there will be a plethora of young predators around. And they're always great value. Now, I was chatting a little bit about the drought and if you're wondering about what time of the year to come, this is not a very typical scene for this time of the year. Like I say, it's normally the grass would be at least four or five times the height. It would be three or four times as thick as this, and the trees would be a lot greener. At the moment, their leaves are very kind of withered because of the lack of rain, and so it would look very different. This is almost like a September or even an October landscape. And that's not to say for one second that it's bad, but it's just different. Hmm. Hello, Jasmine. It's a lovely name from the Times Destination Show. You want to know about crocodiles, and do we get them here? Not so much on the two reserves we traverse. 
Crocodiles like permanent running water like a river, and so there are two large rivers in the Sabi Sands. One, of course, is the Sand River, and the other is the Sabi, unsurprisingly. The Sabi Sands, from which those two, or the two rivers which give the Sabi Sands its name, they have got crocodiles living in them. Uh, but And sometimes crocs will come through into the larger dams, and they'll spend a bit of time in those big dams, and then they'll move out again. So I would never go swimming in one of the dams here for fear that one had popped in for a couple of weeks. But normally just down in the rivers would there be crocodiles, Jasmine? I'm assuming you're a fan of them. They are fascinating creatures. Right, we're now approaching the Arethusa International Airstrip. That's just me being facetious. It's not an international airstrip, it is just a little airstrip which you can fly into if you come and stay at Arethusa. And it's quite a nice spot to go and check for animals because it's open. And animals often like to stay out in the open if they can, especially when it starts to cool down a bit because it means that they can see anything that wants to come and eat them. And if you want to avoid being eaten, of course, uh, looking out for things that want to eat you is a very good defensive strategy. I don't see a vast plethora of animals teeming across the plains at this stage, though. There's an impala up ahead. Right, there's some impala there, and there's some impala further up ahead. I'm going to leave these ones and go further up down, up there. There is a little water hole there, and maybe there's some zebra down there. And why are we doing that? Kelly, you want to know, you're from Minnesota, and you want to know about the smaller cats that we might get here. You, specifically the African wild cat and the black-footed cat. We do get African wild cats here. I've certainly seen their tracks. I've never seen one at Juma, but I have seen them in the Sabi Sands. And we also get serval, which are sort of beautiful leopard-colored cats, slightly larger than your average house cat. And then the other smallish cat would be a caracal, which looks like a European lynx or an American lynx. And it's about the same size, I suppose, maybe slightly larger. But black-footed cat, no. Black-footed cat, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is only found in places like the Kalahari, the much drier desert and semi-desert areas of Southern Africa. And did you ever see a black-footed cat in the Kalahari? Negative. Negative. Very nocturnal, very secretive. Bit of a breeze blowing here. Now, Pat, you're sitting at the Times Destination Show as well, and you want to know about animals that may have died during the drought. Um, I did see one post the other day from the Kruger National Park where a hippopotamus seems to have succumbed to the drought. It's a lot drier the further east, further east you go. Um, so, Pat, not yet, but yes, I, I think that animals will start to die. And I know it's, it's, that's difficult to, to talk about, it's difficult to consider, it's difficult to see. And often people say, well, why don't you just provide water? And the problem with providing water is evident right here. Now, this is an airstrip, of course, and so it's not completely natural. There is a water hole there, and you can see around the water hole the grass has been grazed flat. Now, that's totally normal. I mean, that's in a natural depression where there would be water anyway, so it's by no means a criticism of the fact that there is water there. But in a drought, all around water, the grazing will obviously take a hammering. And if you put more water around, so the grazing will take even more of a hammering and so will the browse. And then when the rains do come back, you have dreadful problems like soil erosion, which are long-term issues. So while it's a little bit difficult to accept the fact that some animals are definitely going to succumb to the dryness, it's part of the normal cycle of things here. The predators are going to have an absolute field day. Their numbers will go up. The numbers of their prey will go down. And then that, what we call dynamic equilibrium, which is a, you know, the kind of uh, arms race that goes on between prey and, or predator and prey, will continue. In wet years, it will reverse the other way around. So it's quite a good time for the predators. And although I think we, we tend to think of the predators as having the best of times most of the time, it's very difficult being a predator out here. Animals are very wily, and it's difficult to catch them. See a 
a bit of weather blowing in there from the south. Okay, we're going to continue off here to the western side of Arethusa and see if we can't pick up on some elephants. There were some tracks heading this way a little while earlier, so that's our plan. While we're doing that, let's go across to Brent, see what he's got to show you, and I'll see you a little bit later. Welcome back. Sorry, there we've just been trying to track lions, but while we've been tracked lions, we've just spotted the apex predator of the air in this area, a martial eagle. And that wingspan is about two meters across, to give you an idea. And uh, for a lot of the small animals out here, this guy spells death from above. See, he's busy, or she's busy hunting. And we did spot her a little bit earlier, but just checking around, having a look if there's possibly any steenbok. Unfortunately, she looks to be flying a little bit further away, but you see how it's riding the wind, using those massive wings to not flap much and just sort of see the, well, seamlessly fly over the area. But it was a really interesting big bird. So we've got actually a very interesting question from Lulu about King Cheetah. Lulu is at the Times Destination Show. Well, Lulu, a King Cheetah is actually a sort of a, a very unusual cheetah. It's, a, it's a, a genetic freak, so to speak, for the lack of a better word. And actually, this area uh, has one of the last sort of recorded King Cheetah that was caught and, and removed from the area just outside the Sabi Sands Reserve in, in a place called Acorn Hook, which is a village not too far from here. So they are theoretically King Cheetah genetics in this part, but there haven't been any seen here since the 70s. But it is always a possibility. And uh, for all those at the Times Destination Travel Show, thanks for jumping on. Uh, on the back of the vehicle with us, even though it was very short. Uh, don't forget, you can always join us on safari. If you ever are missing the bush, or even better, come visit us in person. So, cheers for now, and hopefully we'll see you out here one day. So, the last line track was pretty much opposite us here, heading into this block. So, Jamie's out on the other side, on foot, trying to see if she can find them. I'm just double checking that they haven't crossed the next road. Fortunately for us, a nice sandy road, so the tracks, if they have come out, should be relatively easy to spot. Had a lot of buffalo tracks here, but it looks just to be bulls. in the vehicles if she's out tracking and while we move through William's wondering have there been any wildfires around uh, there are wildfires and we haven't had any this year yet of course this year is very new probably still a little bit green even if we did have a runaway fire for it to go anywhere too far and sometimes in these incredible drought conditions uh, the fires actually never get going because there's no grass for it to burn but uh, Africa is a fire climax biome, and uh, fires played a very important part in the development and management of savannas for many thousands of years. Our ancestors used to burn areas to 
burn the grass to get that sort of green flush after the rain to try and attract animals to an area uh, to make it easier for them to hunt. The Maasai have been doing it for many, many thousands of years uh, on the Serengeti and Mara, uh, actively burning uh, for grazing for their cattle and also to attract prey species in. Uh, we do get wildfires. Um, of course, we do have uh, the Sabi Sands is a very effective firefighting team, but also there are controlled burns to emulate what a wildfire would do, but obviously not over such a vast area. So fire is very, very important. A lot of grass species and that actually need fire to help them propagate better. So while we leave Jamie to look for those lions, we're going to have a quick look. I know Gracie, her tummy's not feeling too well, so we're going to have a quick look. There's some nice fresh Ellie tracks around here. Hopefully we can find an Ellie to make Gracie feel better. Mike in Florida uh, have got the closest on the pig quiz. They say four, but they've got the species wrong. Or maybe not. So actually it could be five. So um, it is uh, the warthog and the bush pig, which we see quite commonly. Um, so they said, and a uh, giant forest hog, which is a massive beast that lives in the rainforest. And the last one was the wild boar. Now, there is some contention whether the wild boar in Morocco are introduced or whether they actually occurred in, uh, naturally there. But the, the, the main fourth true African pig is something called a red river hog uh, that lives in Congo and Gabon and actually one of my favorite creatures up in the rainforest. I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with them when I was in Gabon. And uh, those are the four, the, the, the wild boar is actually in contention whether they might actually be, have been introduced uh, from Europe into uh, North Africa. But the Red River Hog is a very peculiar looking beast. There, I've seen groups of up to 200 in Gabon. Uh, they are incredibly, I find them incredibly beautiful in a very strange way. I see if I, there we go. Um, what the, I'll show you what they look like now. I'm sure I have one here somewhere. There we go. That, that holding it there, is that okay, Brian? There we go, we'll wait for a second. Otherwise I'll show you guys when it gets a bit darker. So that is a red river hog. Very funny looking things. So they occur in the Central African rainforests. And really, really incredible. So during the dry season in the rainforest, they actually move out onto the beach and dig up gross crabs. So you find these groups of 50 to 100 pigs moving down the beach, digging up crabs. We keep searching for these ellies, the tracks are going that way. Uh, let's jump on with James, who's got a brindled gnu. Well, I hope you, I'm not sure how many of you actually jumped on with me, but welcome back to Rusty, of course. Here we are with a wildebeest, a bull on his own, but he's not entirely alone. There are some impala lurking about the place here and he will be using them for their eyes. There is sort of security detail. And unlike in the Serengeti, of course, where they occur in herds of hundreds of thousands, here, a territorial bull on his own is not unusual, but he will normally try and seek out the company of some other antelope or some zebra, and that will help him to see any predators that want to come and eat him. He's a magnificent bull, that one. He really is in very fine nick. Uh, now, 
Desmond, very interesting question. You're asking about something called a golden wildebeest or a king wildebeest. Um, I am actually not, I don't know what a king wildebeest is, to be honest, but I know I, if it's like a golden wildebeest, I think what you'll find um, is that it's a, it's a rare form of coloration. It's like, a bit like an albino animal, a black impala, or a, a, I think they're called copper-backed impalas. And basically what these are, are rare genetic traits that are expressed every so often and you get an animal that has slightly odd coloration. And the reason they've come to the fore and the reason that people are now talking about them so much and seeing so much more about them is that rare game breeding has become a major business out here. And you find these animals being bought and sold for the most astonishing amounts of money. Now, the question as to why this should happen is obviously a good one. How on earth can you sustain an industry like that? What is the point of buying and selling a golden wildebeest? when it's not a, it is naturally occurring, but it's not naturally occurring in, in big numbers. It's just like all the white lions. They're another wonderful example. They're lions that carry, the genes are within the population, and so every so often it, that, uh, that kind of gene will express itself and you'll, you'll see the odd coloration. But to start breeding them and then selling them onto places, I really question the biological validity of it. There's always going to be some kind of question on, uh, you know, how close to the genetics is, how ethical is it all? And I think that there, it's, an, it's a massive, massive business now in Southern Africa. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but certainly out here. And I think the business is going to pop. And I think the bottom is going to fall out of what I can only imagine is a fairly shaky market anyway. I'm not sure what you'd use these animals for other than for hunting. And I know that there's not enough hunting. And they're so valuable that they wouldn't be shot. So, yeah, that's what a golden wildebeest is. You'll find all sorts of major color variations for various animals around the place. Thank you, Desmond. We are now on the very far western edge of our traversing. The fact that you have got picture in Rusty is astonishing, eh? And it's a tribute to Eugene's hard work of late. Well done, Eugene. And we can also hear the final control, which is another miracle. Wonderful. Big bump from the three millimeters of rain we've had this year. So Arathusa not being particularly kind to us on the big game front, lots of fun little stuff going on here. So I think we'll go further north so we can find those elephants we were hoping to see and then we'll probably head back towards Juma. Now, often we're asked about fire, and Andrew, if you just sh sort of yeah, show the camera there, that you can see looks like a fire landscape because there's no leaf. There are very few leaves on the trees, on the tops of the trees. And William, I believe you just asked Brent if we get wildfires in the area, and well, here's the answer to your question. We do get wildfires here. But people often say, well, yeah, I think, you know, they get impressions from California fires and Australian fires and those sorts of fires, and they're tremendously damaging. If you look over here, they often ask if we use fire to clear out bush, so that to open the bush out. You can see very clearly that fire has precisely the opposite effect here. It kills the top growth of the trees, and down below, the trees just sprout from underneath. So it does not kill trees. Fire here does not kill trees. They have adapted to surviving with fire and so it's quite interesting to see how these trees are just a totally different shape because of the fire, but they're almost certainly not dead. So William, there's an interesting answer for you. And this fire is old now. I mean, this happened last, not last, but the one before, the 2014 dry season. You can see the light becoming quite dim as the clouds come over once again they don't look like they're going to do anything other than spite us. These clouds, I don't think they're going to give us any rain at all. I say that every night, hoping that I shall tempt them into some kind of useful effort. But I have as yet failed. Another water buck popping out onto the road. Oh, there's a female. Hmm. 
Now, Laureen, you're in Minnesota and you ask a valid question. You say, with the water levels getting so low, will Irethusa try and remove that water hyacinth from the, the dam? It's an invasive species, as you obviously, you're obviously very well informed. Now, would they try and take it out, given that it's obviously, you know, transpiring and using water that local species could use? I know they have made extensive efforts to get that water hyacinth out of there. It obviously can only be done by hand. And to do that by hand is very dangerous with the hippo in there. It's not so dangerous if it's very large and you can see where the hippo are and they're not feeling threatened because there's lots of water. At the moment, they will be feeling threatened and I think it would be extremely dangerous to try and get it out. It's actually probably a better idea, and I don't know whether this is what they're gonna do or not, to let that dam dry out, then clean the stuff out and start again. I don't know exactly, Laureen. I'm not au fait with exactly what the management plans would be. So we're now on the western edges of Arethusa, like I said. And now this is the sort of territorial boundary between Anderson, that magnificent and slightly terrifying looking male leopard, and Tingana, the equally magnificent but slightly less terrifying looking leopard. So with any luck, we'll find them both perhaps having a little bit of a contretemps. That means fight, Andrew. In this drainage line. Yeah. Lost a little bit of signal there. Sorry about that. We're back now. question also from Charlie. You're obviously also a highly astute viewer. If the leopard orchids are surviving the drought. Now the leopard orchids, for those of you who don't know, are the only orchid species that I know that we get out here. And they on spots on them, hence leopard orchid. And yes, they are seem to be surviving. I've seen a few of them. I think they just go dormant, you know, when it's, it gets dry. They don't have roots in the ground. So they just make as it were, or uh, one rain, I think they'll be absolutely fine. That's the plants here. They just go dormant. Plants are very clever that way. Fish, some fish the same, like the catfish. Uh, the mammals, not so much. Let's go across to Brent. Our signal isn't great. We'll see you when it's a little bit better. So we're still hot on the heels of those Ellie's. The tracks have continued on. So Gracie, hopefully we'll catch up with them not too, in the not too distant future. So the weather has changed slightly. We got a bit of cloud cover coming in. I don't think we're going to get much of a sunset this evening, but hopefully there's some rain on the way. So, we saw that beautiful martial eagle a little bit earlier, and Debbie is wondering what is the largest animal a martial eagle might put up, uh, pick up, while well, Steenbock, uh, sub-adults in parlor, um, they've been recorded taking lion cubs and leopard cubs as well. That's more unusual. Well, we can see the Ellies are definitely being around here. Confirmed reports of Marshall Eagle taking small children. Uh, that and crowned eagle have actually been uh, accredited, but it's never been truly confirmed. But they're definitely strong enough and powerful enough. Uh, my grandparents on their farm lost a few dogs to Marshall Eagles over the years. These 
little guys are petrified of martial eagles. That's why they have watches. And if you watch the sky, obviously being as small as a dwarf mongoose, lots of different birds of prey are able to, to grab them. Hello, guys. Look at that one climbing on the tree to get a better look at us. <laughs> they are very, very cute. <laughs> Did you guys see that? That was what you call a mistimed jump. That dwarf mongoose went for uh, quite an acrobatic maneuver and uh, plummeted. And he was trying to grab the one who's lying over the branch there. It's actually quite high up for a dwarf mongoose, that little one. He looks to be having a great old time. And there are, oh, there we go, you hear that, this is it, alarm call. What happened was actually a hornbill flew over and they just, the wings gave it a big fright, uh, a possible big bird around, and then one gave that very distinct, this is it, and then they all disappeared down to safety. So there's always someone watching, although here comes our acrobat again. This is the successful one, not the one who fell off the tree. You probably find this is their home for the evening. They have multiple of these den sites around. <laughs> Hello, mister. Oh, I think there's the one who tried to jump. Looks like he's about to attempt the same maneuver. <laughs> there we go, getting ready. Oh, there we go, success this time. <laughs> Busy little group of monkeys, these. Now they can be quite playful when they're out of den, and I think that's what's happening here. Scratch, scratch, scratch. You can see they are, have got impeccable balance, apart from one of them. And they climb out, and it's quite thin little branches they are climbing out on. Incredibly social animals. It looks like we're not as interesting as we were. So William is wondering, do we have any meerkats hanging around with warthogs? Uh, I'm sure William is asking that because of the Disney movie, The Lion King. And The Lion King told quite a few lies, William. Uh, firstly, we don't get any meerkats here. They're a desert species. And they live in the arid west, south, and north of us in the Kalahari Desert, mostly, and in the Karoo. So... We don't get them here, and generally you don't find meerkats and mongoose, or meerk uh, meerkats, mongoose, hanging out with warthogs. They're incredibly social animals, but they like to be social with other mongoose or other meerkats. It's the same as the day I see a big male lion killed by a stampeding herd of wildebeest, I will eat my hat, because it, it's just not going to happen. Buffalo, that I can believe, Wildebeest, I'm afraid not. Oh. So the initial fascination that we provided has seemed to worn off a little bit. So we're going to leave them be and continue looking for these eddies that seem to be heading in a southerly direction. Bye-bye. 
violet ones. So I know a lot of you guys watch that Juma cam religiously and you probably wouldn't have noticed any dwarf mongoose. And Lisa is saying, would they actually go to the pan to get water? Lisa, you probably find they get enough moisture uh, from what they eat combined with dew in the early mornings. They don't move too far from the den in the early mornings, but they, I have seen them lick dew off uh, the different vegetation around. Being small, they probably don't need too much water, and you're very correct. If they had to go out uh, to somewhere like the Juma Pan, they'd be incredibly exposed. Uh, if there is a little bit of water around, they will drink, but uh, not, probably get enough water from dew and from whatever they're eating to survive. Temperatures dropped quite a bit. We're about to come out to this big open area where we can see quite far. Just gonna have a quick look if we can see any oncoming rain. ladies on his little patch at the moment we can see some rain in the distance it's still quite far away just make out the drakensberg behind so hopefully we do get a little bit of rain tonight every little bit helps so nora is coming on a safari in may uh, to arathusa and nora is wondering about the daytime and nighttime temperatures give her a bit of a hat. So, Nora, May is sort of the beginning of the dry season, or which is our winter. Very good time of the year to come on safari from a game viewing point of view. Uh, the mornings and evenings will be chilly. Uh, Nora, depending where you're from, depends on your definition of chilly. But uh, on an open vehicle, really early in the morning, you are going to need maybe a, a fleece and a jacket and a long pair of pants. Maybe not gloves just yet, unless you're like me and Brian, you are constantly battling with the cold. And what we consider cold is probably quite pleasant for a lot of our, our viewers out there. Also, during the day, it'll get warm, probably up to around 30 degrees Celsius. But the early mornings, late evenings will be quite chilly. Janeiro. We haven't had a question from Rio de Janeiro for a while. So nice to know that South America is joining us, Southern Hemisphere guys out here in the bush. So we would like to know whether winter game viewing is much better than summer game viewing. It's not, it, 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 oh, in my opinion, it is, it is, it is better. It's, it is different as well. So generally because there's less water around, so the animals have to focus on certain water points. Hello, Mr. Impala. And also, there's very little grass around, so you're able to see greater distances as well as the, the ground being very dry, so it's much easier to track lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog. For me, 
personally, and, and a lot of people disagree with this, for me, the best, best time of the year for game viewing in, in, in most of Southern Africa is uh, the end of October, beginning of November. It is when it is, it's often called suicide month due to the heat. Uh, it's really hot and really dry. So the animals are forced onto the permanent water points or rivers that are around. Uh, and being the end of the dry season, a lot of your herbivores are possibly not in the best condition. So it makes it quite a bit easier for the different predators to catch them. So in terms of seeing a really wonderful predator-prey interaction, and also you must remember there's almost zero grass by then, so you can see vast distances. Uh, also the elephants and buffalo congregate in vast numbers on the water points. So for me, the end of October, beginning of November is often the best game year. But it is extremely hot. But if you're from Rio, you should be quite used to the heat. South Africans are very much big red meat eaters, so we have lots of barbecues, which we call braais. And that a braai is when we make a fire, put a grid on top, and then cook chops and steak and whatnot on there. Uh, but South African delicacies, there's one called a babuti, which is a uh, from the Western Cape originally. Uh, and difficult to describe, it is a sort of mince curry dish um, with raisins. I'm not a huge fan of the Bertie myself. Uh, Biltong is probably one of the biggest delicacies, uh, and Biltong is our version of jerky. We also have a thing called Drovors, which is dry sausage. Dried sausage is also a delicacy. Uh, poiki, which is a very big stew uh, that's made in a very particular way that you don't st don't stir it and also cooked on a fire. Brian, you were about to say something there? Rusks. Rusks. Yay, hey, there we go. Rusks is also a very South African thing. Now, a rusk is a, similar to a biscotti, the best description, and we often have it in the very early morning with our tea or coffee, and we dunk it inside. And uh, from a more traditional African cultural point of view, uh, we've got some other delicacies such as mapani worms, which is a dried larvae, larvae of the mapani moth, very high in protein. I personally think they taste like charcoal, not very pleasant, but uh, also mbungos, which is at the larval stage of the long horned beetles and wood borers. It's a big fat white grub about this big. Uh, that when you cook it, it tastes like bacon, but has the consistency of snot. Um, what else can I think? Pop! Pop is uh, probably one of the most staple diets uh, or staple foods in Africa. It's basically ground maize. It's very similar to polenta, slightly different texture. You can either eat it with a, a relish, which is normally made up of tomato, onion, and chilies, or, or, or spinach, uh, or, or you can eat it as a porridge, actually, with milk and sugar in the morning. But while we continue to see what's out and about, let's go have a look at what James is doing. Right. Hello, everybody. Not much good news on the animal front for you, but as Andrew was just saying while we were driving through this drainage line, what a beautiful drainage line it is. And so it is. Lovely trees, lovely greenery all around, some high-quality sand on the floor, of course. Oh, hang on, Andrew. Great excitement, great excitement, everybody. Let me just untangle myself from the 37 wires I have attached to myself. I feel like I'm in the intensive care unit. 
long way. Yeah, we had a question this morning about a potato bush, and very few people actually know what a potato bush looks like. And we were asked whether it has, and I'm sorry, I forget who did ask exactly. Um, and I've just put my earpiece in my ear hoping to hear, but of course I'm not plugged in, so that was just very silly on my part. Um, and we were asked whether it creates some kind of a bulb, and it doesn't, it doesn't create a bulb at all. Um, I'm just gonna show you a leaf. That's what the leaf looks like. It's called Phylanthus reticulatus, and it doesn't have, this one doesn't smell like potatoes. I'm just trying to look for the flowers that smell like potatoes. It's a very tiny collection of sort of green and slightly red-tipped flowers that makes the potato smell normally in the evening, although I did smell one this morning, and normally also in the winter time. So quite interesting that, that's the potato bush, totally indistinct. And if you haven't been out here, um, you will smell it at night, it's incredible. You'll drive along and you'll think you're near camp because it smells like McDonald's. Slightly nicer than that without the kind of um, uh, smell of synthetic nutrition. But it does smell like potato chips, if you like, or, or wet potato chips and very delicious smelling. But often quite difficult to find. You don't normally find them in growing in such profusion as they are there. All right, Andrew, did you like the potato bush? Phylanthus reticulatus? Yes. yes, I thought you might. On we go. This is getting pretty gloomy overhead. I plug myself in so that Kirsten might talk with me. Okay. Oh, no, I'm out again. Hang on one second. Sorry, it's so difficult to plug myself back in now. <laughs> you think in 2016 that someone would have invented completely wireless communications. Beautiful drainage line, this really very stunning indeed. So we've gone end to end at Arethusa basically. There's a little bit more to the north that we could go to, but I want to head back towards Juma now. And there hasn't been an update from another game drive either. So all is quiet. That's okay. Lots of potato bush. There's one there. None of them smelling, and all the way along this kind of drainage line, there are potato bushes everywhere. There's a... Stop, 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 stop. Beautiful Natal Franklin. Oh, Natal Spurfowl. That's beautiful, isn't that lovely? Well done, Andrew. The most beautiful pinkish orange bill. It's the most obvious feature of the Natal spur fowl. Um, Mike in Florida, you want to know about, there's another one, <laughs> it's coming around. It's following the other one. It's gonna go across the road. Or is it? No, it's gonna stop in the bushes there. Um, Mike, you wanted to know, no, it is going to cross the road. I'm just get him up front here. I see you, Franklin. There. He's gone into the bush. Mike, you want to know about fire and what is the first to go, I think the, your question was, in a fire. Um, I'm not really sure. Oh, first to grow after a fire. Mike, it depends entirely on the amount of moisture there is. So if there's water on the ground, and ideally, I mean, the, the logic is that you would burn during or just before the first rains of over 20 millimeters. And if you do that, then the grass will be the first thing that grows and it will outcompete all the tree seedlings. And so in that way, it's really good for the grass. But if there is no water on the ground, uh, you'll find the acacia trees will sprout almost immediately. They're amazingly good at dealing with fire. Oh dear, I am in trouble. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'll continue driving along. Andrew, you'll tell me if we don't go live, will you? Oh, that's a problem. Um, okay, 
Right. OK, we're, we're going to have to go open comms for now. We'll head towards home to get a new radio. OK, so the, the, the radio, not the radio, the tree that will grow first, Mike, is, a, is the acacias. Oh, there's a buffalo. And after the acacias, you'll find the cambritums will start, or bush willows will start to, to come up. But mainly, it's the acacias. In fact, what I'm going to do, so that Kirsten doesn't feel too shy to ask a question if she has to, is just relay them through Andrew until we can get another radio. Is that all right with you, Andrew? Right, so that buffalo has covered in mud. He's spent his day, obviously, in Red Dam, which is the dam past which we are driving. There it is. It's a quarry, basically. That was probably used to put, the, put gravel on the roads. Oh, there's another buffalo in there. Well spotted, Andrew. And as I was saying this morning, they are astonishingly agile for such enormous creatures and seemingly sort of old and arthritic when you see them walking all sort of deathly slowly down to the water. But when they want to move, my goodness. Right, on we go. So, Kirsten, just to reiterate to you in final control, I cannot hear you. We are incommunicado. All right, thank you, Andrew. Somebody from Indiana. Someone from Indiana has asked, do the animals eat potato bush? Um, the flowers, I think, are pollinated by a nocturnal moth because that's why they smell at night. So it'll be some kind of nocturnal insect, most likely a moth. And I've never actually seen animals eating them, but I think that you find that elephants will eat them. And you may, maybe a few of the other browsers. I'll tell you why I, I think that. It's because when you find them in, a, in an enclosed space like a camp, they grow into quite big trees. But out here, they're normally very scrubby. And that's normally indicative of elephants or other large browsers eating them. So it's probably elephants, actually, that eat them. We're not too far from the boundary now of Juma. And this is prime shadow territory, of course. I haven't seen her for a while. Right. Let's, <laughs> let's go across to Brent and his uh, luscious locks. So it seems like Commander Bond is being heavy on the equipment today. So and finding it quite amusing. He is a very amusing man, the jams. So Brian and I have unfortunately tracked those elephants to where they've moved out of our traverse area. So no one's been down to the sort of northeast this afternoon. So we're gonna go see there. Maybe there's some eddies, maybe there's some leopard tracks. Fingers crossed. Tangana was found this morning, not too far away from our eastern boundary. So fingers crossed he's on his way up north to come visit us. young male leopard who was found on Cheetah Plains yesterday afternoon at three in a row pan. And Craig did tell me, so uh, thanks for, for that, but uh, he did tell me yesterday, he knew how jealous I would be. I haven't seen that boy in what seems to be an age. My 
I'd have to go visit Craig just so I can see Kunyuma. on camera this uh, very dry wet season and Rice is wondering if we have any answers yet from uh, my friend who's a butterfly expert at the University of Advertisement. I haven't yet. Uh, I, I think I sent them on Boxing Day so it might not be, he might have been on holiday so I think I'm just going to have to resend them again uh, this week, this week coming uh, or give them a call to remind them. a little bit to the west and seems to be uh, heading south of us. So I don't, I don't think we're going to get, I hope we do, but I don't think we are going to get any rain overnight. So there are some lines to the north of us, the Talamati Pride and Salati Nails, probably about six kilometers to the north of our, the end of our Traverse area. And I think those lion tracks that James had this morning that Jamie's busy following on foot at the moment are, could be of those three Inkahuma girls. And the fourth Inkahuma is still with the Birmingham boys from what I hear. looking for lions and Dylan in Iowa is wondering what came before lions, what did they evolve from? Uh, Dylan, there, there were various different types of saber-toothed cats and, and large cats uh, before our current day lions and interesting enough us and lions evolved at about the same time but yes and there were even still saber-toothed cats, large saber-toothed cats in, at that time so they would have evolved from one of these uh, larger Predecessors, so you can imagine a lion but on steroids. Always good to check these spots for tracks. So I know Tigano was found just down here over this crest, so I just want to make sure he hasn't snuck through during the day. Nope. We had a fantastic sighting of these three sticks lionesses with uh, the waterbuck silhouetted behind them. And last night, one of those waterbuck 
got caught by those lionesses, not very far from where we saw them, just to the south there on Chitwa Chitwa. I wonder, we're not too far from there, whether it was from the same herd of waterbuck that they managed to catch one. Looks like they are moving actually down towards that area now. Uh, it's the closest water to this part of the world. They do seem to be walking with quite some purpose. I do think they are heading down towards the water. And you guys were looking at them earlier with James, and a lot of viewers noticed for the first time that they've got a very distinct heart-shaped nose. The wind's picking up a little bit. You can hear the creaking of a tree bow there. Windy, dark clouds building. Good night to be a hunting predator. Cheetah, Brent, uh, I'll let you wear my peanut hat. Well, I don't know whether I want to agree to wear the peanut hat just yet without knowing what the peanut head hat is, Cecilia. Uh, but I will try my best to find a cheetah. There were two males also to the east of us yesterday. I'm not sure that they were found this morning again, though. So we'll keep a lookout for tracks. set up a territory about eight kilometers to the south here on what is now Londolo or what is now what is Londolozi game reserve and from what I hear they're doing quite well in that area so that's what happened to the Matimbas we, we are gonna now carry on towards the what's left the dry bones of the Buffalo's Hook waterhole and while we do that let's go have a look at what James is up to Some beautiful kudu bulls here, just browsing on some of the newish vegetation, I suppose. Beautiful little herd of them. Bachelor group. There they go. All of them with a magnificent rack of horns. I'm just going to sneak forward a little bit. No, in fact, wait, let's stay here just for now. They've been quite confiding and they can disappear into the bush very quickly. That's not the greatest view, is it, Andrew? Shall I go, for, let me go forward. Let me just sneak forward a little bit. I thought I saw more. Maybe it's just the two. And there they have a little browse, eating some cumbretum, which I don't think they normally would by choice. But because it's dry, they will take whatever they can get. There are three of them there. There's another one behind. You'll find them, just like giraffes, they'll move from tree to tree, dependent on the amount of tannin that the trees produce. 
having been attacked. Hello, Jen. Um, very lovely question about medicinal plants. Jen, there are lots and lots of medicinal plants around here, and I'm, I, I don't know if your question is relating to use um, or, or instinctual use of trees for medicinal purposes by animals or by human beings. Um, certainly, there are lots, every single tree, every, everything oh, by animals. Um, I think I think there are. There's certainly no proof that animals use trees specific for specific medicinal purposes. I think it would be strange, actually more strange, that animals didn't, for example, if they felt a certain way, know that they should eat or feel like eating a certain species of tree, given the different chemical compounds in the different species. So I would say it, there's a distinct possibility that they would use trees medicinally. I think elephants especially, uh, you know, they, they eat such a vast variety of different species. And I think that you'll find that the youngsters are taught which ones to eat when, depending on how they feel. There's absolutely no kind of scientific evidence for that that I've read of, but I, I would say it would make complete sense to me that through evolutionary time, animals would have learnt which plants make them feel better and which plants, you know, if they've got a sore tummy, what should they eat? And if they have a sore tooth, perhaps, what do they eat? And one of the examples of this was a story we saw once at another reserve when an elephant had just lost its tusk and it was bleeding and it looked ugly and it was probably an abscess in the nerve that the tusks have. It's an enormous nerve, so it must have been tremendously painful. And it was picking a specific species of tree and stuffing the leaves into the cavity left by this tusk. And we think that there was definitely something medicinal or uh, to do with medicinal use going on there. Very nice question. Thank you for that, Jen. All right, let us carry on along the road here. We're back on Juma. I can hear again. Right, an interesting question from Mr. Two Vox. Hello, Mr. Two Vox. Interesting Twitter name. Mr. Tuvox, you want to know the difference in size between a male kudu and a male nyala? Mr. Tuvox, a male kudu weighs in the region of 270 kilograms. Now, in pounds, that is roughly, say, 560 to 570 pounds for a big kudu. A nyala is about half that size. A nyala, well, in fact, quite a big nyala weighs about 120 to 130 kilograms. And that in pounds would be, say, 280, 280 or so pounds for a big nyala bull. So there is a substantial size difference. And then the bushbuck again is half the size again of the nyala. So those are the sort of three spiral horned antelope that we get here. Antelope belonging to the Tragelaphus genus. Very quiet on the mammal front, and I think it's got something to do with the weather. One just sometimes goes out and feels like it's going to be a quiet drive, and I certainly had that feeling when I drove out today. That's not a bad thing certainly makes us appreciate the amazingly exciting game drives we have most of the time. And it's always good to get your eye in trying to find small things, small interesting little aspects of the bush that actually make the place all the more fascinating. We're driving down a road that we started off on today. It's called Rebecca Zoe's Road, sorry. And we're heading down towards Philemon's Cutline. We're gonna go and have a look at Treehouse Dam and see what's there. I haven't checked in that little hole if there's still some of spring water there. The water flowing underneath the ground and the end in that little stream is in fact still flowing. So that will be interesting to see. To get a view here of the western horizon. 
These clouds have just kind of muddled everything. They're not actually committed to rain. They're not committed to going away. They're just hanging there over the landscape, ruining the sunset, ruining the general sort of vibe. Wouldn't you say, Andrew? We must get back together. I agree. Should be fired. It doesn't even smell like rain. You can normally smell the rain before it arrives. Andrew, why are you looking so disgusted? <laughs> right, to Treehouse Dam we go. Oh, I see that I'm unplugged. This is why there's a stony silence from the final control. Right, I'm back in again. Me too, Paul Rizzo. You very kindly wish or hope that we will see him Vula again. I hope so too. He's um, 11 or so at the moment and not looking his best last time I saw him, starting to lose muscle mass on his hips. And I think that's, he's not too long for this world. Beautiful male there, but I really like him. He's my favorite one. Now, Kathy, you want to know, you say, is there a story about the elephant skull at Arethusa? Uh, Kathy, if there is an elephant skull at Arethusa, I don't know about it. Andrew, do you know about it? No. And I certainly don't know anything about the story. Sorry, Kathy. Can you maybe give us a bit more context and I'll try and find out for you? More accurately, I'll ask Jerry to try and find out for you. Well done, Kathy. Jerry's now earning her supper. Well, she was already, but she's earning an extra helping. quiet out here. Ah, now Cecilia, you want to know about primates and you want to know if there are any baboons or chimpanzees in the Sabi Sands. Um, Cecilia, there are unquestionably no chimpanzees here. Chimpanzees only occur in West and Central Africa. Well, I suppose Rwanda's kind of East Africa, but West, basically West and Central Africa. I keep pulling myself out of this system here. It's all rather irksome, to be honest. Um, so no chimpanzees here, but absolutely, yes, baboons. Plenty of baboons, but not so much where we are. And that's because we think that there aren't a great deal of roosting sites for them. So they prefer to roost along the big rivers, like the Sand River, where there are big fig trees and big jackalberry trees where they can roost and stay safe. And so I think they spend most of their time down there on the Sand River. Certainly when I was at Londolozi, there were baboons every day and they became something of a menace in the camp. I've seen maybe two or three troops of baboons since I've been here at Juma, and that's now about 10 months, so quite a long time. Yeah, not a lot here, but they definitely are around. Monkeys are the other um, circopithian primates that we get here. And then the slightly more primitive primates would, other than ourselves, of course, would be the bush babies or Galagos. They're beautiful little things that look like, uh, a bit like Mowgli from the Gremlins or a bit like a lemur, although they're not lemurs at all. Yes, just searching, searching into the bland light of this afternoon. The light is very bland suddenly. Ooh. Now, KP Potter is a zoomie. 
And KP, you say that you were operating the Arethusa Dam cam earlier today and you found a spotted dick or water dickop's nest under the deck and you'd like to see it during the day. Well, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, I will definitely put that on our little group to the Arethusa guys and see if they can't find it. Um, unfortunately, we can't, of course, drive our vehicles under the deck there, but yes, we will have a look there. Can you maybe be a little bit more specific as to which deck it was? Because I would love to see those little dick hops. Or thick knees, as they are now called. I know I might have to turn the lights on. It's all of a sudden gotten quite dark. Hello, Marilyn in Montana, a beautiful part of the world which I have yet to visit. Um, Marilyn, you want to know which spur file that was that we saw. We saw the Natal spur file. It's got a very orange and pink beak uh, with a little sort of bit of yellow at the back and then pink legs. And that's how you would identify the orange, at least the Natal, Natal spur file. It used to be called the Natal Franklin. Natal is one half of a province in South Africa, down to the east coast. Hmm. Norm, I wish I knew. You want to know what has happened to all the zebra? You're in Tennessee. Um, Norm, they're around, they must be around, they don't migrate in this area. Um, they could, I mean, they can go distances, so I mean, they may well have decided that the water around here is not to their taste, and they do, are, they are water dependent, so they may well be on Biffles Hook today, for example, um, where there are a couple of big dams, so I think that's quite possible that, that, that they're over there, Norm. So maybe that's where they are. Certainly, they ain't around here, are they? Sorry, Andrew, I should have told you I was going to sit down. But difficult to keep up with me, I know. Right, we're at Treehouse Dust Bowl. Brent is on foot. With any luck, going to find the lions that I failed dismally to find earlier this morning. Then what we'll do here is just have a quick look in that hole and see if there's some water. Hello, James Richard. Um, I'm just going to pop down into the dam here to see the water. So I will be incommunicado with Kirsten, but you should still be able to hear me. Andrew, you'll be able to see the levels, can you? Um, James, you want to know about the Sands Pack and has there been, have they been sighted recently? Are there any updates on their numbers? James, I haven't heard anything about that at this stage of the game. Um, uh, yeah, I, don't, I actually don't know what's going on with the pack at the moment. Right. Well, hardened clay, but from the Buffles hook in that it doesn't, it's obviously got less clay in it, and that's why it hasn't stuck together and created those sort of hexagonal towers of uh, razor-sharp edges that Andrew and I found. Water. Yeah. little water and this hole was dug by elephants no can't hear me how about now is that all right sorry about that everyone so this hole was dug by elephants a little while back and um, it means that there's water flowing underneath here, and I think that's why there's less clay here. There's obviously quite a strong flow of water underneath, and this will be providing an astonishing number of birds, probably warthogs, and um, even buffalo with a little bit of water to drink during these rather tough times. And I think the reason that there's no greenery in here is because it's much easier to access, for example, than the Buffles Hook. 
greenery, which is surrounded by those razor sharp towers of ionic clay. It's okay, Andrew, I'm all right. And then yesterday we had a question about yellow weavers and whether we still get them around here. And um, the answer is yes, we do. There are their nests, but those are old nests. None of them were built this year. And for, I think because of the water, they like to build over water. Because of those nests, uh, or because of the lack of water, we've had absolutely no new weavers' nests, which I just think is very sad, because I love the weavers. I love their swizzling noises and the activity around their nests. All right, on we go. Right, our next port of call will be a tw uh, tree, twin dams, sorry. There's definitely no water there, but maybe we'll be lucky with a leopard track or two on the edge of the drainage line there. Plenty of hyena activity, of course. Maybe we should pop to the hyena den. Maybe they will, they will not disappoint us. Yes? Oh. Oh, I've somehow managed to unplug myself again. This is disastrous. I'd have to do something about that. Okay, Kirsten, go ahead. Kathy, you've come back to us with some information on the elephant skull that you were talking about at Arethusa, and you say that you thought you read about it somewhere on Twitter that there wasn't an elephant skull there that was either from an old and honored elephant bull that died or perhaps from some sort of folklore. I'm afraid I can't, I can't help you at this stage. We'll try and do a bit of research and find out what that's about. Sorry about that, Kathy. to sort out my plugs here. This is where we saw those badgers, Andrew. Andrew and I saw a badger and a pup there a little while back. In fact, probably on one of my first drives. Two badgers. Two badgers, yes, mummy and baby. All right, let's go across to Brent. He's back on the car. Let's see if he's got a nice update. See you just now. So unfortunately, it seems really quiet, uh, this sunset safari, but that is how it goes in the bush. Sometimes there's an animal around every corner. But sometimes they are being a little bit scarce, but they are still a huge amount of amazing things out here, even when you're not beset with them. Big hairies and scaries. makes his way from the east of us today and he might not cross during the sunset safari but definitely might cross during the night so definitely worth our while coming back down to this area early tomorrow morning before the roosters are even awake to see if we can find any sign of him Uh, 
Tony in British Columbia is wondering about some local stories during the quieter drives and spotting that go-away bird. Now, a go-away bird is considered to be a real pest in a, oh, by traditional hunters because they alarm to your presence when you're walking on foot, chasing all the possible game away, like the spy of the bush. And that very loud nasal call that they have. Quite dark already, but you can see them nicely silhouetted, those beautiful crests blowing in the strong breeze. One folklore story about go away birds. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a bit rusty. I'm going to have to reread a lot of those old folklore stories. Uh, but it's about the hunt. It's called The Hunter and the Go Away Bird. And I've just been sitting there while we we're looking there trying to remember the, the intricacies and the facts and the details, and they're just escaping me. Sorry, Annie. I will definitely reread that, that uh, book on African folklore and see if I can. Uh, deliver it with a, a, a bit better. I don't want to half tell it. It sort of loses a lot of its value. I, I, I just, I've just drawn a complete blank. I can remember sort of patches of it. I'll think if I can remember another one for you, Annie, while we're moving around on this quiet afternoon. only bird folklore I can remember off the top of my head right now uh, is how the ground hornbill became the king of the birds. Uh, ground hornbill is obviously one of the largest birds we get here and they are expert hunters of lots of little things and in particular snakes. So the story goes there was a great war between the snakes and the birds. And the king of the snakes, the black mamba, was inflicting massive damage on the birds' numbers of their troops. And at this stage, the Grand Hornbull and said he doesn't want to have anything to do with politics. So he was staying out of it, and the birds eventually begged and begged for the Grand Hornbull to get involved. And on the battlefield, Eventually, after much begging, the ground hornbill became involved in the, in the battle, and the black mamba, king of the snakes, moved out to the front and said, Is this the best you birds can do? And two quick, deft swipes with that big, powerful beak, that ground hornbill had cut the king of the snakes in two. Therefore, not even wanting to be part of the politics or even royalty, uh, the Grand Hornbulls begrudgingly became the king and queen of the birds. Definitely going to have to brush up on my folklore for you, Annie. I've got some wonderful books about it, so I will have a read this week and we'll try and feed you guys through a, another couple of African folklore stories. Ones that you haven't heard before. So Jamie had no luck with those line tracks. They disappeared in the middle of the block. Quite a thick, thick block, and with this light dropping quite quickly, uh, she made the call to head back to the vehicle, which is the correct one. You don't want to be wandering around in the dark when lions are about. But what I'm hoping is they might head towards Gallego Pan or towards Sydney Dam, one of the, those are the two sort of closest water water points for a late afternoon sundowner. 
and I'm going to slowly make my way back up towards that area and hopefully we have a little bit of lion luck. And they've got a lovely little baby with them moving along the edge of the river system here called the Mawati. There we go, there's the little fella. It's still too small to see whether it's going to be a girl or a boy, but the one at the back is a little boy. And they do really love this riverine vegetation. See how that little guy at the back starting to get his dark coating. And when he's a big boy, he'll be dark chocolate brown. And they go into the riverine thickets where they're probably going to rest up for the evening and chew the cud. Salati males up here as well. So the reason they tend to spend more time in those areas is because that's the most likely spot uh, that they're going to face competition from. At the moment, I think it's very unlikely that another coalition of males will slip into Juma. But the wonderful thing about the bushes, you never know. But I'd say it's very unlikely. It'd be really exciting if they do, if it does happen though. Ancestors actually departed from in about 1818 uh, to move to Africa. Uh, Jilly said she heard that some of the South African birds in the bird books, the names were changed of the birds, and she wanted to know if it's just the common names or also the scientific names or 
was it due to the Afrikaans uh, birding fraternity wanting them changed? Uh, you know, it was actually not to do anything with Afrikaans. The, the scientific names stayed the same. So it was mostly to do with East Africa and Southern Africa, which are the two really big birding communities uh, in Africa. And what happened is birders were getting very confused because they would come on a safari in South Africa and I would go, as their guide, look at that beautiful bat in there. They would then, the next year, go on a safari to East Africa and they'd buy a Kenyan bird book or East African bird book. And they would say, and then their guide would go, have a look at that. Isn't that a beautiful short-tailed eagle? So it was one and the same bird. So there was quite a lot of confusion there. So what was decided is that the first name, the common name that the bird was ever described as was the name to be used. So basically it all reverts through to the first common name ever used. So Batalia stays a Batalia whether you're in Kenya or here. And the same goes for a lot of the species that had different names in different areas. Now, funny enough, the Kenyans agreed to everything, all the East Africans, except for one. So, what the, the East Africans called wax bulls, cordon bleus. I have no idea why, but that's what they call wax bulls. So, a blue wax bull would be a blue cordon bleu, which is very strange in my mind. But, uh, so, that was the only one the, uh, the East Africans refused to let go of. So that's the only bird that might confuse people in Southern Africa and Zambia or Central Africa. The wax bulls are referred to as wax bulls, but in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, they're referred to as cordon bleus. I mean, you can imagine a violet head cordon bleu, a blue a cordon bleu, a common cordon bleu, an orange breasted cordon bleu, a swede cordon bleu, an East African swede cordon bleu. So, yeah, it is quite a strange one, but it is just to make it much easier for people traveling through the different areas where there's a lot of birders uh, to make less to have less confusion. Nearly coming upon the Juma waterhole. Last little gamble of elephants for the evening before heading up a little bit further to the west to see if there's lions that maybe started heading towards Sydney's waterhole. question from Christopher in Arizona he says if you have a craving for fast food uh, how far do you have to get, go to get it and what's available well Christopher fortunately we would have to go quite far it probably take us close on two hours to drive to drive to get fast food and the only fast food available in that area is KFC which I'm sure a lot of people Oh, look at it, we've got some Inyalas displaying, or I'll answer your question as we move towards those Inyalas, Christopher. Uh, and then there's another thing called Debonairs and Steers. Uh, I don't think you get those in North America. Debonairs you might get in the UK. Uh, Debonairs is basically a pizza place, uh, and Steers is just a burger joint. So that's the closest fast food to us. Now we have some Mayor Linyala having an I'm prettier than you are competition just below the final control. And it's probably due with all these lovely ladies out here. You can see this male is actually smelling that female's behind, so there might be a female coming to Easter's quite soon. But he's not even involved. Oh no, there we go, sticking up his ankles a bit. But showing, beating up a, a little bush to show how impressive he is. There we go. Beautiful Inyala. Now, we saw the females 
a little bit earlier, heading off into the bush. And that young male, that young male will look like this one day if he survives. And you can see that Inyala's mane of hair is erect. And it's called phylo erection. And there we go, you can see he's rubbing his preorbital glands on the bush and also showing how strong he is. And here we go. This guy is to the left is showing that very stiff leg Inyala walk when challenging and you can see how they're going opposite each other so this is quite an interesting evolutionary trait that Inyala have developed so instead of locking horns immediately like lots of the antelope archer do if they can they will settle it with for lack of a better description a model walk off and whoever looks the prettiest or actually looks the biggest and strongest is the winner of said walk-off. At the moment, I can't tell who is winning. Normally, the one that is winning will raise its tail and show the white from underneath its tail. But these guys should, could just be being boys, being close to each other and doing a bit of showing off because there's that bigger male who's in amongst all the females. Uh, he could be winning and these guys are just on the peripheries there we go see that pre-orbital scratching again i'm just going to have a look what they do for a little bit actually brian i'm going to just roll back so you can see guys I think are unlucky in love and I think that's the guy who's won and they're just staying away from him you can see how he's really getting uh, he's smelling the females nether regions and following her on quite closely so she might be coming into estrus quite shortly so these guys might just be posturing on the edge when this big guy has already won the competition for the ladies sit here for a little bit and see how this plays out if there's any action we will let you know and she's not so keen on all the attention so maybe not in estrus just yet uh, but i know james has found his way without getting lost fortunately to a lot of our viewers favorite spot on juma at the moment look at this incredible shot everyone we've just come up, we're only about four feet from this hyena, and Andrew's obviously got the double tap zoom on. Look at this eye. We've been spent, we've actually spent a very pleasant five or seven minutes here while you've been watching those Nyala do their dance. And seeing the ticks that are in the eye there, we've watched her nose, or his nose. I think this might be a young, uh, might be a male. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? can see some activity at the den so we will go there we're, I mean we're only about mm, we're probably about 50 meters from the den look at that we were going to open the shot like that and say guess what that is you can see the ticks there and we were asked a question this morning we were chatting about whether or not hyenas have less fur on their faces than they do on the rest of their bodies and you can see that I suppose it is slightly shorter than the rest of the fur certainly more sparse isn't that wonderful? That is amazing. That's yeah, very artistic of you, Andrew. Well done. Good job. All right, let's go in and have a look at the den. There seems to be some activity there. It's just called mules. Guy is very relaxed. Not in the slightest concerned about us. Oh, I see a little baby, baby. <laughs> and the water.
water buck. Two water buck. We're just, they've just gone trotting off into the thickets over there. youngsters. I think those are the two Ds having a little snooze. I did see one of the Januaries with her head out over the top of the adult there, but she seems to have disappeared. It's smelling quite ripe here, hey, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> and that is Madam, that is the matriarch with her scaffy ears and missing bottom left canine. And the canine that you can see on the right there, on her right-hand side, is quite blunt which is indicative of the fact that she's obviously used it a huge amount, and so she's not a young hyena anymore. But it is fairly smelly around here. I suspect the large meal they had last night has been processed through the gut and deposited in various spots around the den here. Everyone looking very happy. There's a little one, Andrew. So sweet. Probably about five weeks old now. No, less. Yeah, well, maybe five weeks. I left on the 12th of January, and we were pretty sure they were, they were here for about a week before I left. So let's put them born somewhere around the 5th of January. That puts them at about, well, just, just on four weeks. Hello. So sweet. And that's their mother, of course. Two of them, we did see two yesterday. And that, very interesting to me how, when we were at the other den and Corky and Pretty were there with their two, with their two youngsters, um, there was always a kind of antagonistic relationship between Pretty's youngster, November, and the two others, and with Corky. And now with the matriarch here, or who we think is the matriarch, there seems to be a kind of peace. She puts up with all of them around her, which is very interesting. And as one of our one of our viewers pointed out, she said, is this not perhaps, you know, one of the reasons that she's the matriarch? Because she's got this kind of social astuteness. She's, she's obviously very tolerant of the others, and maybe it's not just purely about dominance. Um, and I think there might be something to that. I especially think that it's, I mean, they do, they tend to inherit their status. I'm a bit like a royal family, rather than to kind of, excuse me, rather than kind of gain it through social wiles. But they do say that the hyenas have a social structure as complicated as some of the Circopithian primates. So those would be monkeys and baboons around here. And certainly, with well, the monkeys and baboons and the closer you get to human beings, the more social guile uh, you have to have in order to get to a leadership position. So it may, may well be that this hyena is just more socially astute, has higher EQ than the others. That would be interesting to study. I'm not sure how you'd study it, but it would be interesting. little needle-like teeth on one of the D's there. Very glad to hear that you're all enjoying the super zoom that this camera has and the close-ups that we can get, it is just wonderful. It's a little bit more difficult to operate this camera, so that's why um, the other, the big camera doesn't have the same sort of zoom on it. Um, it's much more sort of easy to use in a live situation. But when we do use the little one like Andrew's using, it's just great to have that zoom. I mean, she's missing lots of teeth, that hyena. Hello, Donna Hall, and you say that hyenas have become your second favorite animal since watching Safari. Dare I ask what your first is?
Is that mud, Andrew? Or was it a scar? Look, it's mud. Yeah, I think it's mud and spittle. Delightful combination. Very peaceful here, just the odd drongo calling. I can hear a spider hunting wasp going vzzz around the place and the wind rustling through the tamburti and knobthorn trees that are grow on top of this termite mound. Now, Miss Jin, Texas, you ask an interesting question about hyena diet and the fact that they eat so many bones, would that help keep their teeth sharp and their teeth clean? Um, it will absolutely have the opposite effect. It will not keep their teeth sharp at all. It will blunt their teeth. That's why that hyena has got a blunt canine in front there. It's from the chewing of bones. It's why she's missing her left front canine. And you can even see the carnational teeth there that would, would normally have a sharp point on them are pretty blunt at the moment. As in terms of keeping them clean, I suppose they might keep the teeth cleanish. I certainly wouldn't like to take the full force of a hyena's breath on my face. I feel it might singe my eyebrows off, but it, it you know, probably does keep them clean to a certain extent. I think their saliva plays the major role in keeping their teeth clean though. But no, the bones will blunt their teeth. And it's one of the easiest ways to age a carnival is to check out the sort of sharpness of their canines. Hello, Jen. Um, an interesting one, and one that I didn't know until we had a little puppy once that started to lose his teeth. Jen, you want to know if, if these carnivores lose their teeth. They do. I think, if I'm not mistaken, just about all mammals um, lose their milk teeth and get big adult teeth, I think. And certainly I don't think hyenas are any exception. And they're born with teeth, you know, hyenas, a bit like Richard III. Uh, well, as Shakespeare would have portrayed him. Um, they're born with teeth, and that's very unusual. And it's certainly, I think they lose them. I've certainly seen little hyenas with missing teeth, and they seem to grow back, so I'm assuming that they lose them. I couldn't tell you when it happened, though. I would guess somewhere around weaning, or just after weaning, uh, which is six, uh, six months for a hyena up to a year. So let's say somewhere around six months in a year. A quite close atmosphere at the moment. It hasn't been a very hot afternoon, but quite a close atmosphere. There's the super zoom again. You can see the blunt claws completely like a dog's claws. Remember, not related to dogs at all, but their claws are very similar because they are not protractable. Also, look how closely packed those pads are together. They're closely packed together, which means that I mean, their, their tracks look very kind of um, squashed. They don't look exploded. They don't look perfectly neat and spaced like a cat's do. And then also look on the um, sort of right-hand side foot that you can see there, the top pad is very ki obviously kidney-shaped. Now that shape you can recognize from the merest smudge. It's quite an easy, one of the easiest tracks to identify is a hyena's track, even if you can just get a smudge of that kidney-shaped side toe. Hang hanging tongue, nice to be able to lie in the in the dirt and hang your tongue there. Ah, now Donna, you say that your second favorite animal was hyena, but the lions are your most favorite. Well, those are the top two predators here. These hyenas, the adults normally go foraging around about now. I suspect maybe that They'll, adults will hang around here because it looked like they had a huge meal last night. Lots of saliva. 
delightful. And Julie, you're in Washington and you want to know how many sets of teeth hyena have. Well, just the two, just the milk teeth and the adult teeth as far as I understand it. Um, if they lose like that canine that's missing there, it won't grow back. And I think that is the same for just about all mammals. I'm just getting an, hearing an update on the radio from the lion tracks that we had this morning, and I don't know where those things have gone. I think they've flown away somehow. I know Jamie was following them this morning, this afternoon. And Brent, he's just gonna go into that area now and check whether there is any kind of movement, because they will start to get moving now. The little ones starting to roam, they're very confident around the matriarch here. They don't seem to need to have their own mothers here, but of course she won't suckle the youngsters. She will look after them. That's D1, look at the, look at the, um, the pink, see the little pink pads on, the, on her back feet? Oh, thank you. For that, there we go. And that's the same, that's the same one with the white on the front. So they're pink underneath and white on the front. Some strange anomaly, there's just no melanin in that part of her body. And I think that's the little female and the male has got two normal black feet. CJ, an interesting one, and I think your, your postulation is correct. We're obviously watching that hyena s s salivaring, I nearly said. Salivating. Salivaring isn't a word, Andrew. Uh, salivating all over the ground there. And CJ, you want to know if that's some kind of a sign of hydration, or does it indicate the hyena's hi uh, sort of hydration state? Um, I would imagine that were a hyena to become dehydrated, it would struggle to produce that level of saliva, so I think that definitely does make a difference. Uh, but I think that her salivation there has probably far more to do with the enzymes being produced by her saliva in order to help digest that vast meal. I don't think it's got to do with the fact that she's drunk a huge amount of water and therefore is sort of getting rid of it that way. But I would definitely say she's perfectly well hydrated if she is able to salivate like that. Very, very astute, nice question. Thank you for that. Just hear the robins starting to give their last calls. Mm. Now, Teresa, you've watched a video with 60 plus individual hyenas in it, two clans meeting. It must have been quite a noise, and I suspect quite a battle as well. You want to know if I've ever seen two clans m meeting? I have, Teresa. Uh, it was a very noisy, vicious affair. Once, I only, I've only seen it once, and it is astonishing. This clan, of course, is probably only about 15 or 16 strong. So were it to meet up with a much larger clan, and I know there is a big one around Simbambili and Arethusa, okay. uh, were this clan to meet up with them, I, don't th I think it would be fairly one-way traffic. Very lovely little clan that we have here. We won't be here for too much longer. As soon as it starts to get dark, we'll leave. Very question, nice question from Donna Ree in California. Um, you want to know, you say you haven't seen November for a few, night, few days at the den here. Um, I saw her 
yesterday evening, Donna, very briefly. So November is around. Uh, you want to know why we don't check the other side of the den. That's simply a function of the fact that we'd need a bulldozer to check the other side of the den um, to get all the way around. There's a lot of sort of foliage in the way. And I did do it once from the other side and there aren't any holes on the other side. There is one around the sort of right-hand side, but I think November is probably just asleep inside. And you want to know if it was perhaps Pretty, who was the injured one with the bite on her neck. I don't think it was. Um, as far as I could tell, it wasn't her. I also had the same guess, and it was sort of confirmed to me that nobody else agreed that and thought it was her, so I don't think it is her. Thank you, Donna. Three very nice questions. I did stay here another few minutes, maybe two or three minutes. Just, I mean, if there wasn't any cloud, I think it would be fine to stay here till seven, but I don't want to be here after dark because the camera is now going to start to struggle. So we'll sit here for a few more minutes and we'll go across to Brent and see what he's managing to find. And we'll go, we'll do a sort of loop around the area where we hope the lions might be. Cecilia, you, you say that since you've been watching the safaris, you've gained the most information and learned the most about hyenas and gained the most respect for. Since I've come to Wild Earth, my, the time that we, I've spent with hyenas has been exactly the same for me. I mean, I certainly respected them always, but I've learned more about them than I have in all of my years in the bush previously. So it has been just a wonderful privilege to spend the kind of time that we have with them at these den sites here. All right, I think let's, let's leave it at that. It is getting quite dark now, and we're gonna to have to try and start using a light, which I don't want to do at the den here. Righty, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith, get an update from him on his lion tracking. He's sort of in that region driving around there. We're gonna drive around to the north and then down towards home and see if we can't pick up those lions. Until then, I will see you later. tracks came into the into here so it is water over there so i'm just slowly cruising through uh, hoping to catch them out on the road as it gets a bit cooler and they start moving but as as we have seen they generally uh, at this time of the year while it's quite hot only getting moving sort of after seven o'clock at night but there's always that chance. So Virginia is wondering, as the seasons change, are there certain animals we see more or less on, less of as they change? Most definitely, although this year is a bit of an exception to all those rules because we are in a drought. Uh, normally, we see a lot more zebra in the summer months than we do in the winter months uh, because, sorry, opposite way, we see more zebra in the winter months than we do in the summer months. But because there's so little water around, we're seeing a lot of zebra now. Uh, also, a lot of your small creatures, genets, mongoose, bush babies, things like that, you generally see much better civets in the dry season or the winter months when there's less ground cover for them to hide in. Birds definitely, uh, we have migrant bird species that will be heading back uh, as soon as it starts getting chilly here. So if it's cold here, they head for warmer climes. The European rollers uh, will even be seen in the south of France uh, during uh, the summer. But during the north, northern hemisphere winter, we do have a lot of bird species that come down for our summer. Sign and no sign of tracks just yet. So, warm welcome to Carol in New York. Carol
I was wondering, do you have any bat-eared foxes in this area? Unfortunately not, Carol. Uh, they occur in far more drier climates to the north of us. Probably the closest bat-eared fox to us is maybe just over 100 to 200 kilometers from here. As the crow flies. So in this low light, there's a possibility I might have missed tracks, so I'm just going to loop on ahead to the water. While we do that, so I'm just going to turn off the car's engine and slowly freewheel down the hill. Gives me a chance to possibly hear any alarm calls. So if we're lucky to hear those lions roaring. What sort of bats do we see? Uh, we've got quite a few different bat species here. The most common are the free-tailed bats or and Egyptian tomb bats, tiny little insectivorous bats that scoot around at this time of the night, grabbing all the flying insects. We also get quite large fruit bats as well. Peter's epileptic fruit bat is the most common. Uh, and they are sort of like flying foxes. But very difficult to get on camera, unfortunately, unless we find them in a resting position during the day and just a little bit too quick and the light's just a little bit too dark to catch them properly but probably the most common bat wherever you have any type of human ha ha uh, habitation is an Egyptian tomb bat. So we're about to pop around the corner. Who knows, are we going to see a lion or are we going to see Nothing. Elephants. <laughs> Gracie, there are elephants. Unfortunately, they are quite far away and across the boundary, but hopefully they help with your tummy. Oh, little boys and a wildebeest. You can see there's a little baby off to the right. Two young bulls closest to us sparring. And there's a good chance those lions are going to head this way, but maybe a bit later. Uh, we've been searching for elephants. We've almost covered the whole of Juma. And lucky enough, just before the end of show, we're lucky enough to find some. Lovely little boy is having a bit of a, a game, a little bit of a tussle. You can see how strong the wind is behind there. You can see how the gusting wind is blowing that tree. not taking too much notice of the eddies behind him. Another lone bull. But the females will move through between the different territories. And slightly to the right, there's also a hippo out the water. And some impala. Tampa is wondering, do we have fireflies here? We do, but we generally only see them when we get really good rain. 
I haven't actually seen any this year. Brian, you? Mm -hmm. So when we get rain, we do see fly flies. I haven't seen any this year. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Now that's the young boy jumping up on the other young boy, just causing trouble. You can see how the herd's reaction has changed. They've suddenly banded together like there was a potential threat. And quite often those young bulls cause so much havoc that they get quite a strict beating almost from the females. And that's why they quite often chase to the peripheries of the herds. So they've had their evening drink and they're heading on. There's a tiny baby there. You can just see him under a couple of tiny babies too that I can see in this herd. in total with the two young boys who are staying behind to play in the water. So others are disappearing off to go feed. probably going to spread out now, feed for a little bit. They probably will rest at some point tonight. But being these massive animals, they do need to eat quite a lot. And there we are, the hippos are there, the elephants are off. And it's been quite a quiet, but nevertheless, a beautiful sunset safari. It's been great having you on the back with Brian and myself. Don't forget, we're going to be out before even the roosters are up tomorrow morning to try find you some animals. So join us for the sunrise safari. So from Brian, the thumb, and myself, have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. And let's jump on with James. Okay, we're now on a road called Gallego Shortcut, around which I thought, of, well, around which I was looking this morning for the lions. I don't think I drove this particular area of it, and there are three, there were four vultures sitting in this tree. They're not all the same species. Now, when you, that's a white-backed vulture that you can see. There was a hooded there. There's a hooded there. When you find multiple, oh, no, it's a white-backed. Sorry, he's not hooded. But when you find vultures in a tree like this staring intently at the ground, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest to find that there might be some lions in the bush there. We obviously can't go in there tracking on foot at the moment because clearly uh, that would just be silly in the dark. But we'll probably pop back here during the course of the morning tomorrow and see if we can't find them. So I think that's really quite interesting. Maybe the lions are where we thought they were and somewhere in this particular part. So let's drive slowly down Gallagher shortcut here, see if there aren't any other trees filled with the Walchas. Let me just get a spotlight out quickly. For the last two minutes of the drive. Just see if we can't find the telltale sign of a lion in here. No tracks on the road. Maybe they're in there somewhere. It's very thick in there. be very nice. There are some more vultures over there flying out of the trees. I wonder if something didn't happen here. This is the one section of road that I didn't drive this morning. I just saw a pushed over tree and I thought that was a, I thought that was a lion, but it wasn't. It was a pushed over tree, which isn't anything like a lion.
everybody. That's going to be it from us for the afternoon. This is the road that I took this morning instead of this one. Big thank you to Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for your efforts today. Thank you to Kirsten, of course, in the final control with Jerry. Thank you for Jamie for her tracking expedition. And thank you to all of you for your questions and comments. Thoroughly enjoyed, as always. And thank you for your time. Big thanks to Brent and Brian. And we will see you tomorrow morning at 05.30 during the glory of the African dawn. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye.